Good morning. Um, we don't know if we were going to wait for Marisol. Apparently, we're not. OK, that's good. This is my first day here, so I don't know. <laughs> OK, fine. So we're going we're gonna to start um, looking at the carryover of uh, nutrients uh, from broodstock to eggs and larvae. And uh, we're here, Sofia and, uh, and Carlos. I'm Carlos. She's Sofia. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to be looking at uh, two different aspects of, uh, of this subject. Uh, one from the point of view of the nutrition of the, of the brood stock, and then with some uh, uh, special techniques to transfer the, to transfer the, the, the nutrients to the, into the eggs. So just to, to have a, an outline of uh, what I'm going to be talking a, uh, about, uh, I just wanted to bring some, uh, as, as I'm coming from industry, I, I wanted to bring some, at least some notes or some notions of uh, general management uh, uh, from the industry point of view or from the, from the far, farm point of view. So we'll be looking at very few notes on broodstock management in the commercial environment, in the commercial hatchery, just some general con considerations. Uh, a few considerations also on broodstock feeding in practice, ration, timing, welfare, and, and personnel. Just a few notes to get into uh, spawning performance, egg quality, and, uh, and feeding. So broodstock management uh, in the commercial hatchery. Uh, a primary requirement uh, in good uh, in good farming practice is the control of sexual maturation and spawning. That's uh, been said uh, by by Bromwich in '95. So what we're looking at uh, is everything that has to do with the performance of the uh, of the brewstock, the production of uh, of seed. Everything from we don't have a pointer either, do we? No. So everything from uh, the culture conditions of the brood feast, the induce, uh, the induction of the spawning, how do we recruit our brood stock, the conservation, the selection, the breeding, uh, the management techniques, and how do we uh, 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 obtain our seed? Are we bringing it directly from the brood stock? Are we practicing cryopreservation? Are we buying it from somewhere, <coughs> somewhere else? Uh, Teach a man to fish. I don't know. <laughs> but also, uh, if we if we have a recruitment plan, how do we culture? How do we culture our, our actual fry? How the the fry the, the fry that is always destined to to get into our uh, our brood, uh, brood stock population. So everything we're talking about is we're talking about a long term management that interests uh, things from health. Welfare, nutrition, recruitment, selection, uh, uh, the biosecurity of the whole operation, and feeding. So we're talking a lot about, about long-term management plans, and it's all from the point of view of the commercial hatchery is all uh, directed to productivity, productivity of the unit from the point of view of fecundity, specific to the species we're talking about, the size. What size is more productive from the point of view of output uh, and more efficiently productive? The genotype, the number of spawns, the sex rates in the populations, the population dynamics associated to that specific, uh, species, and the programming of the uh, of the spawnings. And something that is uh, capital on all this: how do we get from uh, plan management to uh, execution is dedicated personnel, personnel that is uh, specialized and that is uh, devoted to that uh, to that unit. So, in practice, uh, aspects like ration, timing, welfare, uh, and again, personnel. How do we how do we put all that in practice? Well, we have to think that gonad formation and reproduction is a very challenging process for the animal. Uh, so. We would all be, you know, quietly munching away and growing if it wasn't for our hormones just uh, 
bugging us to do else and uh, and reproduce uh, during during gonad formation and, and, and reproduction during gonad formation we have the mobilization of lipids uh, and reserves from uh, uh, from the tissues of the brood fish uh, towards the formation of uh, actual physical tissue in uh, in the case of, uh, of, of females but also just on expenditure of uh, energy uh, to support all that uh, you have to think that for instance in species like uh, like Coupling, you're going to have 70% uh, uh, to 76% of the uh, whole uh, uh, fat tissue mobilized. Okay, uh, in the case of the female, 40% 40, 40 of that is going to be forming uh, 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 eggs at the end of the day, so vital genin. In the case of the males, uh, all that is going to be a spend, a spend on uh, on energy and metabolism. Right. So it's a very demanding, very depleting process for the fish. So something that is very important to manage is the recovery and stock up uh, feed. Uh, it has to be carefully managed and attended to according to the species and also ac according to the programming of the populations of uh, brood stock that you are managing at, at a certain point. So again, sufficient and dedicated personnel and resources has to be uh, devoted uh, to these to these tasks. Uh, feeding is a very important part of this, and uh, uh, is not only is not only the nutrition; it's, ju it's, it's just the practical issue of making it uh, reach the the animal. So you have to get the fish to eat. As simple as that. Uh, and management techniques, uh, management tools uh, like uh, setting feeding targets for uh, weekly uh, uh, periods of time, so percentage body weights, something that you can uh, indicate to your workers, to your personnel, that this is your target for the week, for instance. Uh, and it allows you to uh, carry out the control of efficient feeding. This is just an example. Uh, this is an, uh, an analysis of daily feeding rate on a, a couple of populations of, uh, of uh, uh, sea bass broodstock uh, along a couple of years. So you have the, the spawning season around this, around this time, around uh, February, March, uh, when feeding rate and temperature is confirmed. Okay. So temperature around uh, the, the, the 12 degrees during the uh, during the spawning season, and then rising slowly, and feeding rates accordingly during the spawning season and low rate and low temperatures are around the point, point 0.1, point 0.2 per day. This is per day, so calculated ration per day. So if you're feeding so many kilos per week, you divide that into biomass and time. Okay. So you have a, uh, 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 your feeding rates uh, grow, raising after the uh, spawning season for the recovery of the depletion depleted reserves of the fish, and just before uh, just before the next spawning, the, the feeding rate starts to, to decline. <clears throat> so the fish, what is doing here, is replenishing the reserves and transporting them into into the gona, but. When you're managing your population in your farm, you have to be very careful with things like this. When your temperature is rising, temperature that you're all, which is a tool that you're also using for uh, managing your spawning season, you're also going against sometimes the uh, the feeding rate of the fish. So you have to be careful that you are, you uh, you have to consider that at some points in your daily in your yearly uh, cycle. The temperatures are going to be sometimes not optimal for the fish to feed, okay? And that's something that something that you have to get and take into consideration. In this graph, we have percentage body weight uh, feeding and uh, uh, near week and temperature on the red line. What you see is that during long uh, during high temperature uh, uh, weeks, the feeding rates decline, and as as, uh, as soon as the temperature starts to come down, the fish are starting to feed again. Okay, 
So you have to uh, you, you have to bear in mind that that's the situation that is going to be uh, that you're going to have to manage. Also, we've we've talked about uh, percentage uh, percentage feeding or daily feeding rate. And this is, uh, as I mentioned, a calculated rate. Why? Because uh, you're probably not feeding every day of the week. You're maybe feeding three days in the week or five, five days in the week. Uh, and you also have to consider, according to your species, what is the most effective practice to feed. So are you going to be feeding uh, your target uh, uh, ration during three days in the week? During five days, is it going to be an advantage to divide the, the the feed during five or three days, or maybe every day in the week? That's something that you have to find out about your species and about the way you can uh, manage better your operation. Spawning performance. Uh, I'd write the male and female, although. I'm not going to be talking much about female, but we do have to consider male and female uh, because there's not much written about male uh, spawning performance related to, to feeding. And as we've said before, there's a lot of, uh, it's a very, very demanding uh, process for the male as well. And there's a lot of uh, relevance on feeding, nutrition, and nutritional profiles and the performance of the males. So we don't know much and we don't know enough about it, I think. And what egg quality, what is it? Well, Bromwich again, 95, defined uh, egg quality as those characteristics of the egg that uh, determine the capacity to survive, which is not a, it's a good definition, but it's uh, quite, quite general. <laughs> I like to think of the capacity of the egg to produce two-day-old larvae one, two, three day old larvae, depending on the species. I think that that's, uh, that's uh, even more relevant. And something that we've been looking for for a number of years already is early assessment of the uh, quality of the eggs, just looking at different characteristics like chorion, fertilization rates, Blasphemy and morphology, but obviously you want uh, you want a tool that can give you some early assessment on that. And what influences uh, spawning performance and egg quality? Uh, a lot of the things that we've been talking about on management are going to be influencing it, but feeding and nutrition is a very important part of uh, of it all and has a very significant incidence on spawning, spawning performance and the quality of the seed, both the egg and the, uh, and the sperm that is going to be produced. So getting into uh, specifics of it, uh, we were looking at production back in the day, production of uh, uh, diets that were dry diets, pelleted diets, inert diets, also for the brood, uh, for the brood fish, looking at uh, getting away from uh, trash fish based diets that uh, were the most common used uh, uh, diet uh, uh, some years ago and that are still used in, uh, in many operators of the industry. So we started looking at how to put, how to compare uh, fresh fish based diets with uh, with pelleted diets with different uh, ingredients we were looking at uh, uh, we started comparing krill pelleted uh, based diets with uh, fish or fish uh, meal based diets but with enhanced dha so we were looking at basic components of uh, the lipid fraction which are uh, very relevant for the for the brood stock and for the egg formation and we were looking at epa we were looking at dha and uh, started looking at the different, comparing different levels of inclusion of DHA and EPA in the, in the uh, pelleted diets compared to what the trash fish based diet would give us. Um, we were looking in this case at halibut eggs. So we, we, they, these were halibut diets and uh, looking at the impacts of uh, uh, this pelleted diets, fabricated diets on the content of uh, essential fatty acids on the eggs 
uh, what we what we saw was that the uh, DHA was uh, selectively uh, acquired into the eggs to levels in uh, higher than those in the diets, and that uh, the levels of uh, DHA, EPA, even arachidonic were comparable uh, in the eggs, both on the on the uh, on all the diets that were being fed to the levels that we got with uh, the, the fresh fish-based diet. After that, we were looking into arachidonic and how arachidonic was affected, uh, how the transfer of arachidonic in the, in the diets were, uh, to the eggs were affected. And uh, we used uh, diets with the, with the broodstock that varied from half percent to 1.8 percent of the fatty acids include included and we looked at oh, again the impact on the on the egg quality and the transfer into the eggs uh, and a very interesting thing was that in those new diets we were including only uh, 10 percent uh, uh, content of DHA and even and even so the levels of DHA in the eggs were uh, maintained so the the, 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 the brood stock were the animals were including in the in the eggs uh, preferably uh, uh, DHA even to higher levels than those in the diet. Um, also arachidonic was uh, captured by the eggs and transferred into the eggs to levels higher than those in the diets and what we could see is that through two consecutive uh, spawning seasons you would get a rise on the levels of uh, inclusion in the eggs mm -hmm. as opposed to the levels of DHA which from one spawning season to the next were coming down so what we were seeing was that okay there was a uh, there was a, a, a transfer into the eggs uh, uh, of DHA to and an arachidonic, so there was a preferred capture into the egg of, the, of these fatty acids, even to levels higher than the ones you found in the diets, but you had to make sure that the levels in the diets were high enough so that there was no depletion throughout time. Okay, so you have to ensure that you could deliver. And how did that impact the quality of the egg in terms of, for instance, hatching rate? We were getting uh, these which were uh, on the, uh, in Hollywood eggs, uh, quite representative figures of what you could get in commercial situations. But as you see, uh, the standard diets with the standard content of, DH, of uh, arachidonic in the diet were, were getting 28% uh, hatching rates, while the enhanced arachidonic diets were getting much better, much better performance. Uh, during the Arina uh, project, we've been actually looking at a similar situation uh, for the sea bass feeds, and we've been trying out uh, with uh, together with Bioma diets <coughs> with different levels of, uh, of uh, arachidonic content by the, the inclusion of beta bar, um, and we had a first uh, well, just the first season of uh, of results. Uh, that I'm showing you there, that is just uh, showing us the baseline for it. Uh, and uh, we are waiting for the coming weeks to, uh, to get our uh, second year uh, of the spawning season uh, on these diets to get the uh, new data. But unfortunately, we don't have them yet. Uh, another aspect of it is not only how it transfer, uh, how we transfer the, uh, how the nutrition uh, uh, influences the uh, nutritional profile or the comp uh, composition profile of the eggs, but also the growth and formation of the actual uh, gonad of the fish. And this is uh, work uh, done in carp, uh, where uh, the fish were fed apart from their normal feed, which uh, which the fish get from uh, basically filtering in the in the ponds. They are supplemented with different diets. Traditionally, they would get uh, 
maize-based uh, diets, uh, but in this case, they complemented that with either one of two diets, one of them with some fish meal ingredients uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and fish oil, and another one with uh, a vegetable uh, oil, linseed oil. And they were looking at what the results from that was well, from that supplementation, and what they found was that there was a, 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 an improvement of the growth and production of uh, raw in the fish uh, with the inclusion of these uh, new diets. So, improving the levels of, uh, of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids would give you an improvement in the production of actual uh, reproductive uh, tissue of gonads. Uh, but then again, we're looking at substitution uh, of uh, uh, marine elements or marine uh, 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 raw materials with uh, plant origin materials. And how does that affect, uh, uh, that substitution affect the, the uh, broodstock diets? Well, fish oil is still one of the... Uh, key limiting factors for, uh, for the, uh, the, the growth and sustainability of the, of the uh, industry, of the feeds. So this, uh, this supplementation or this uh, uh, substitution uh, is, not, uh, is not free of problems. Obviously, fish oils are full of N3s, uh, N3 hoofas, which are very important fatty acids that uh, are normally derived from the linolenic acid. Uh, and that the fish, uh, through several routes, manage to produce. Um, so what happens when? Uh, sorry, the, mm, with the uh, freshwater fish, uh, these two routes are uh, have, well. They work perfectly. They don't have a problem. But with marine fish, we have the known problem of. The activity of delta six, the saturations, and uh, the the uh, poor capacity of the fish to actually uh, synthesize the N three N three fatty acids. So we have to uh, to give them the, those fatty acids with the diets. But when we give them fish oil, we, when we give them vegetable oils, we don't. Uh, we're not giving them those uh, those fatty acids. So what happens then? And uh, this is some work done with uh, by Marisol Izquierdo and, and her team on substitution seabring broodstock diets. And what they were looking at was at uh, different levels of sub substitution in the broodstock diets of fish oil, 100% fish oil diet, up to 100% linseed oil diet, going from 40, 60 to 2080. Feeding that to the uh, to populations of, uh, uh, of uh, sea bream broodstocks and looking at the impact of that on the uh, spawning performance. And uh, there was all obviously some uh, very striking uh, results uh, and very clear results as well. So you, you would have a, a reduction of both in the total egg production and fertilization and uh, hatching and viable eggs but also a reduction on the survival of uh, three-day-old uh, three-day-old larvae, as you would go substituting substituting the uh, fish oil for linseed oil in the diet. Okay, especially anything from uh, sixty percent onwards. So the egg fatty acid profiles were very correlated with the uh, uh, broodstock diet profiles and. You can see in this woobly table that, well, basically uh, 16, uh, uh, 16, 18, 1, N9, and DHA were the, uh, the most uh, uh, abundant uh, fatty acids, irrespective of the of the diets in all the uh, uh, in all the eggs coming from the different uh, brood stocks. Uh, there was a decrease on the 16, 16 zero uh, content of, uh, uh, of uh, fatty acids, and there was also a decrease on the 17. So, the, uh, 
the content of uh, 16 and 17 uh, point oh, uh, fatty acids in the eggs were reduced and we've been reduced uh, 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 with the substitution of uh, fish oil with uh, uh, linseed oil. But you also had uh, an increase on the, obviously on linoleic acid and uh, 18 to six, 2 and 6. Uh, the 20s, the, uh, the, the series of 20, 20 and 3, uh, 20 and 6, 24 and 6, and uh, EPA, and uh, uh, they were uh, decreasing as well uh, with the substitution of the, of the, of the oil. Uh, and that obviously had an impact also on the life of the uh, of the larvae that came from those eggs. So there was no, and there was no practically no difference on the larvae until day 32, but then at day 46 you would have smaller and uh, uh, lighter larvae which were yeah, smaller and the, the, the body weight was less. But a very interesting result, uh, the activity of uh, delta six in the uh, uh, in larvae coming from uh, broodstock with uh, an 80% uh, substitution was greatly improved. So basically what you were doing, you were producing uh, larvae which were more allegedly more able to deal with the diet that their parents were getting. So conclusions, uh, reproduction and girl formation is a, is a challenging process that requires a long-term management plan. Uh, the Bristock nutrition and feeding has a very significant incidence on gonad formation and spawning performance and on egg quality. And the diet formulation can modulate egg uh, larvae and gonad formation and composition and quality of the fish. The nutritional programming have you have we seen in the last uh, uh, part of the presentation uh, through bloodstock nutrition is a very effective and can improve the ability of the juveniles to use vegetable oils and vegetable meals. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> So the floor is yours, Sophia. You want uh, this one? Yeah, I, I see the one. Oh, hello, good morning. Um, my name is Sofia Ingrola and I work at the Center of Marine Science in Algarve, in Portugal. And today I will going to talk about the sonophoresis and how we can manipulate egg composition when the eggs are outside, meaning that after spawn, after the, all the parts that Carlos was talking. And uh, why do we want to do that? So one of the work packets in uh, Raina, it's work package six, it's uh, about uh, nutritional programming, meaning that one of the things that you want to discover is how to give, uh, to give a nutrient or to trigger some metabolic pathways in the very early stage that will be maintained during their, uh, their life. And uh, what, how can we explain the concept? So it's, it's something that appears in the 90s and it uh, came from uh, human studies and it was done by, uh, by Lucas. And when he said that if you give a stimulus because we'll give some positive or, a, or an insult, 
if will turn out to be a very bad thing, uh, during a very critical developmental stage of development in animals, we can reset the, the, the metabolic pathways and to change some of the standard and normal development of, of the fish. So we work in aquaculture. So for us, this <coughs> can give us really very, very nice advantages. Because if, if you imagine that if, you, if, if we find a trigger that can uh, make a fish to retain more protein, automatically we will increase their, their growth. And uh, in the hyena, if we find the right trigger in the, at the right time, we can put fish eating more or be more efficient when they are eating um, plant, uh, plant ingredients. And that would be very nice in the, in the modern uh, times that we are. So, but as you, this is the optimal and the fantastic uh, situation. And we have several, several problems. And one of the problems is exactly that, with, which, which trigger? Okay meaning what nutrient, if one nutrient, two nutrients, the two together, the two apart, and when uh, should we give this, uh, this stimulus. The other thing is, uh, and it's uh, where the sonophoresis appears, is that after you do the part of the diets to the broodstock, uh, you cannot do anything to the eggs. So meaning that we have to develop something that can incorporate a nutrient inside uh, the egg. So, because, this is what I was saying. Besides the part of the, the broodstock, we have the first feeding, and everybody everybody knows what we can do with uh, with the larvae, and we cannot do anything with uh, with the eggs. So the son of Fres is appeared appeared in the in the 90s at, at the time when it appears. It was said that it could enhance the uptake of several um, uh, several nutrients and compounds uh, inside the, inside the fish. Meanwhile, from our from what we know, never, they never developed the, the patent, and the patent was uh, was lost. So we decided uh, in the side of what package to in the Heine project to develop our own uh, phonophoresis uh, system that basically consists, we have a program inside uh, the, the laptop where we can change all these parameters, and then it will send that information to the function generator that will uh, this, that will give the information to the amplifier, and here is our probe. And inside this, it's the the eggs and the nutrient that we we want to to supplement to the egg. <laughs> One of the things that um, we have to keep in mind is that it has to be water soluble. So this is one of the things that uh, we have to keep in mind when we decide to incorporate something inside the egg. So it's relatively portable more or less. Uh, it's not invasive and uh, we can do it at the batch scale, that is very nice, meaning that we can pick it up and going to, to a hatchery and to visit Carlos, pick some eggs if you let us, and uh, <laughs> just incorporate the nutrient inside, um, inside the egg. And because of this uh, low stress and high survival, we had to make some, um, some experiments uh, before and I will uh, explain them uh, later. So this is more or less how the system uh, works. <clears throat> we have the electrical output that will come from the, our generator that will provoke a mechanical vibration in the, in the water. That mechanical vibration will produce an acoustic sound wave that in our case it's an ultrasound wave that will reach the egg. And when it reaches the egg, it has um, three systems that you can... Uh, basically, it's like high pressure and, um, and the nutrient will uh, will enter the egg not always <laughs> sometimes we didn't manage to 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 put the nutrient in uh, inside so this is mm, just to show you where we have the hour wave and what we humans can uh, can hear so we are more or less between the 20 and 20000 uh, hertz the dogs that hear very very nice they are threefold higher than us and then we have the bats and the dolphins that are re really at the top and our, uh, our probes, we have two probes at the moment. They are more or less working between the 80,000 uh, Hertz until 1 million uh, point two. So regarding the part of the high survival, uh, when we started to work with, uh, with BRIM, we didn't know how, 
what was the most suitable um, developmental stage that we uh, that we could work without killing all the all the eggs, or if we are going to kill some of the eggs, we didn't know. So this was one of our uh, first uh, experiments. Uh, and what we did is that we tested different developmental uh, stages, meaning that we had the same batch and we just waited for the eggs to develop in the, to this uh, eye blastula and neural and the appearance of the first pigmentation. And then we saw that we could not work at a very early stage because we were having a very high um, mortality of the embryos. So, and because in this one we have already the embryo, because it's the embryo that we want to manipulate, we want to include, uh, we want to include the nutrients in the old sap, we decided to work at this later, uh, later stage. So, as you may imagine, after all these years we have made several uh, experiments, and I'm just going to show you <laughs> two, because uh, we don't have any time for, uh, to show you anything else. But uh, one of the experiments that were, uh, that were really nice, it was this one, and where we're trying to incorporate leucine and aspartate, and choose these two amino acids because they have very similar weights, but they, they behave very differently in, in, the, in the water. Aspartate, is, uh, he likes water, and leucine, not that much. So we were thinking that maybe this could uh, have an impact in the way that some of the nutrients were entering uh, or not. Uh, inside the inside the eggs. Another thing that we had, that we tested in this experiment it was the presence of a, pre uh, um, a previous buff with pronas that is a protease to more or less diminish the layer of the of the egg envelope if uh, somehow we could help the nutrient to to enter. This is something that we do with the micro injection because uh, marine fish uh, eggs. They have a hard corian, so it's quite difficult to micro-inject. So we tested this also with the, the part of the zone of resist to see if we could improve. And um, we also tested the two um, sonal parameters just to see what was happening. So this is the, we were checking viability right after one hour of the, of the protocol and 24 hours after. And as you can see, um, we didn't kill any eggs, <laughs> so it was just a very good, uh, a good result with both uh, with both amino acids. So it was not uh, um, a big issue, and uh, the hatching rights were okay. So meaning this one is the control; it's the eggs that we didn't do um, anything, and everything is uh, it's it's normal. The results regarding the the supplementations. And uh, what we saw regarding the part of the pronas, that is, uh, it's this uh, no and yes regarding the previous buff, we didn't see any differences. And we were able to supplement the, the amino acid inside the egg at the four, uh, fourfold, uh, with a fourfold increase in both of the probe. Um, probe uh, <coughs> parameters. With the leucine, we had a very similar, um, similar results, but we didn't achieve that much. We only were able to increase to double the amount of leucine inside, uh, inside the eggs. At the moment, we have already more results uh, with the other uh, amino acids. And as soon as we started to increase, because we started this one with, five, with the five times or more, and now we are uh, we have results of uh, 50 <laughs> times uh, times more, and I can say you that uh, with the 50, we managed to achieve uh, 43 times more the nutrient inside the uh, inside the egg. Then we made some experiments with the rainbow rainbow trout, and because everybody was saying that rainbow trout eggs are quite sensitive and we cannot touch them before the IUT uh, stage, we decided to make a different, uh, a more uh, sensitive probe and then we had uh, a low um, a low frequency a more even lower frequency probe meaning that it was working 10 times with the earth's death 10 times less than the previous uh, probe that we had and that was the only difference between this uh, trial with the uh, with the probe with the uh, with the trout and it was a uh, it was a good thing that we had this <laughs> this idea because we managed to increase 
the survival of the eggs after the after the procedure because you cannot go to an actually saying that you want to do something with the eggs and say oh i'm just going to kill half of them <laughs> just <laughs> to start so we have to go there and we have to have very nice uh, numbers to show them to convince them that is a very good thing so after this we decided to make an experiment using a dose response uh, approach with biotin and um, we, biotin is uh, quite important for the, um, for the metabolic pathways of fatty acids, spread chain amino acids and gluconeogenesis. So it's really straightforward, six points of biotin with the, with the, low, with the low probe that we have uh, developed meanwhile. And we had these very nice results, meaning that this work were the control, were the eggs that it, uh, we didn't do them anything. And this was uh, uh, the solution said this one was only with a ringer, uh, ringer, ringer medium without any biotin inside. And we get, it at, we get this, uh, this very nice uh, curve at, uh, at the end. We were quite, uh, quite happy with it and we managed to increase a lot. And this one we used a different approach. It was not uh, something more because we were uh, trying to discover the amount of biotin inside the egg, and we didn't uh, manage. So that's why we use a different uh, approach when we did the um, the experiment. Now we have several uh, new parameters regarding egg composition with this project, and new new protocols that new metabolites that we can analyze. So. Sonophoresis is a viable technique to, to modify it. It doesn't work with everything. Like uh, when we were working uh, with, uh, with glucose, we never managed to include uh, glucose inside the eggs using uh, sonophoresis. That is a quite soluble. <laughs> uh, but uh, with amino acids, it works uh, quite well. And uh, with some vitamins, we also tested um, other ones and we have uh, very nice results. So it's really very dependent on the nutrient and dependent on the species. And we have to make some previous uh, experiments just to see uh, which are the best developmental stages for not to kill all the um, all the fish, of course. So thank you for your attention. So I guess we can take some questions if you have any. We might even answer them. <laughs> we might even know them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, the result of this uh, nutrient in, uh, enrichment is quite promising. Have you tested the, uh, the survival rate after, after first feeding? Oh. Yes, we um, we have done it uh, with uh, with Sibrim, and uh, we didn't saw any effect of the supplementation, meaning that uh, all the of the larvae, oui? <laughs> <Loud. laughs> all the larvae etched uh, quite nicely, and they were uh, they were eating. We are still analyzing it. The, we have made a lot of short term experiment with several uh, incorporations, and now we have uh, we are done, um, doing the long term experiment with uh, the supplementations. And until now, we didn't see any difference at the part of the feeding, and we also. Um, we're checking the um, the yolk dep depletion. We were measuring uh, to, until um, eight days after etching. It was when we finished um, the short term, just to check if the in the short term what were the effects of the supplementation. That, that means so far there's no difference between the control and the. The meaning of the survival. Yeah, yeah, meaning of survival. Uh, until now, we didn't see we didn't see anything, but these are very preliminary results, and meaning that I'm just checking the results that I have seen is until eight days. Now we are running the long-term uh, experiment, and we are still waiting for the results. Yeah, <laughs> okay. You want coffee? <laughs> not yet. No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Okay, so we've got the next speaker. Yes, it's Stefan.
Ah, Stefan? Ah. Do you want the timer? The timer. Okay. Okay. And where is the computer? Okay, so <clears throat> this is the last, normally it's the last talk, so be careful about this. So uh, I am uh, Stéphane Panserat, so I'm working in, um, at INRA in France, in the same unit than uh, Geneviève Coraz, and the uh, unit of nutrition, metabolism, and uh, aquaculture. So I will show you some of uh, our results in, uh, in the context of nutritional program and uh, in the context of the ARENA project. So just to tell you that all this, all this uh, data are from uh, myself, but also my colleague uh, Inge Gordon. So we are working all together about this, uh, this uh, research thematic. So here, just, uh, no, I just to do that. Yeah. So I will do uh, firstly an introduction just to explain to everybody the nutritional concept. So I hope that I will not kill you. Let's say just, I just want to show you, very simple, but uh, what is it exactly? And uh, after, I will take a first example with the first feeding trout with carbohydrate, a second example with the first feeding trout, but with a plant-based diet. And uh, I, I will do at the end the conclusion. So for the concept, for the nutritional programming, so it's uh, <clears throat> nutritional programming, the definition is here, is that early nutritional stress, stimulus, not stress, it's, it can be a stimulus, could modify durably the genome expression in adults. So what is it exactly for this? So just uh, to show you is that um, here with the fish, so here you have uh, Alvin or Ravi, you have uh, Alvin here, you have adult fish. So the idea is that firstly, you have to do a stimulus. So a stimulus is something like this. So with diet or something else. And so the fish or the animal will receive and record this stimulus. So for the mechanism that are involved, some are linked to the organogenesis, the tissue formation, but also one that is very well known now, it's epigenetics. And so why it's uh, programming is that uh, the animal will, will remember this stimulus all along the life. And later, if you, in an adult fish, if you do what we can call a challenge or something like this, you can reveal that this fish had previously a stimulus, even if the stimulus is a very short stimulus. So this is exactly what we call programming and nutritional program. Just to tell you that it's something that is now well known. And for example, in mammals and in humans, and just for the, for the history is just to show you that uh, the first description of this concept is, uh, was done by uh, two researchers in uh, 1992. And it's, uh, it's uh, because they observed that the children born during the Second World War, they, they have all a tendency to develop metabolic syndrome and diabetes. So they had apparently a specific intermediary metabolism. And this is linked to the poor nutrition of the mother of these children at the period of, um, at this period, so during the Second World War, and uh, it's a specific phenotype that we call safety phenotype. And this is uh, just here, uh, 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 a schema about this. So you can see here during the gestation, you have the baby. So here the environment is uh, what we can call nutrient poor maternal environment. And this, um, this uh, children will remember this nutrient poor and maternal environment. And when the, 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 you have adult, you can have someone that normally has 
higher capacity to survive if the nutrient poor, if the environment is uh, poor in nutrient. But of course, after the Second World War, the nutrient, the environment became very rich in nutrient. And so with this, they keep the memory of the poor environment. And so with this, you have a different intermediate metabolism and you have a different, for example, susceptibility to disease. So this is exactly the concept of programming is that event during a critical or sensitive period of development may program for lifetime structure of function of the organism. So this is just to show you during the gestation, but just also and not to be too long, but to show you that it's also something that is uh, well known now, now in, uh, in mammals, but uh, just after, during uh, the postnatal nutrition in weaning, and it's possible to have also some, uh, we call metabolic programming in this, uh, uh, it, it, was, uh, it has been done with, uh, with rats, and uh, it's something that is very well known now, and you, so you change the milk of the mother to a new milk that, we, that is very rich in carbohydrates, uh, poor in lipids compared to the normal uh, milk. And with this, we can see that in the adult, so the first effect is very strong for the small rats. So with this type of milk here, you have a difference in pancreas, in fat tissue, in gut, if you have some differences in pancreas, you will have differences in liver and also in brain, for example. And so what is important is that these differences, long time after, you can find that this, these differences has, has some permanent effect. And for the adult rat, you have hyperphagia, hyperinsulinemia, metabolic syndrome, obesity. So it's really a programming linked to the, what we can call outside first feeding here. Uh, stage. But also, depending of the species, you can find that also in insects. And for example, with the, with the bees, you have something that is very beautiful, is that with the larvae, depending of the feeding of the larvae, you will have two very different phenotypes. You can have a queen here, or you can have a worker, and they are totally different. But it's exactly the same genome. And the difference is, is related, mainly related, to the first feeding of larvae. So depending on the royal jelly that is very rich in carbohydrates. So if you have this, if the, this larvae is fed with this, you will have a queen. So here it's also what we can call a programming by, by first feeding. <clears throat> and this is related, as you can see in this paper, related also to epigenetics marks, and especially to DNA mutilation of the genome. So, if it works in mammals, if it works, of course, in insects, we can say that probably it works also in, in fish. And so at the beginning of the Arena project, only small paper, not a lot, uh, did uh, previous data about this. And uh, we did with uh, Inge, the, the first paper in, in, uh, in rainbow trout about trying to do the, to observe or not the concept of uh, metabolic and nutritional programming in 2007. And also some, some paper are with uh, zebrafish, because zebrafish can be very useful for this type of, uh, of studies. But the main question, when you, are, you want to do nutritional programming, there is two types of questions that are very important. For example, for the stimulus, we must know which one. What sort of stimulus we have to do? You can do many things different. Of course, here, I will speak only about nutrient. Even with nutrient, you can have different type of nutrient. You can use, for example, plant-based diet or specific nutrient as carbohydrate, as methionine, for example, also, it can be very interesting. But you can use also stimulus linked to the environment, to the hypoxia, to the temperature, to many things like this. <clears throat> also the question, one or the, the second question is, how long you have to do this stimulus? Short, high, we have to do and we have to test this. And when? And when is also very important. And Sophia, speak about um, the eggs. And it's, for example, we can try to do stimulus at the timing of the egg formation, or we can do that at the first feeding. Or of course, if you want to do programming, you have to be very careful to not decrease survival. Because if you decrease survival when you are doing your stimulus, it can be more a selection than programming. 
And of course, for the challenge at the end of the fish, you have to, to reveal this programming. You can do no challenge also, of course, but you can do some challenge and which one, how long. So I will show you this with two examples. And uh, <clears throat> so here for the Arena project, so I'm the leader of this uh, work packet six about nutritional programming. And here we decide to do three type of programming, three different timing. The first one, and Marisol will discuss about this at the last uh, talk, it's uh, the modification of the vitalis composition by the boost of nutrition. So we can do that here. We try also to do at the level of the hex, so the <laughs> Sophia. And so modification of the vitalis composition by using technological innovation, such as sonophoresis. But also we can do something at first feeling uh, uh, larvae or algae, and it's what I will show you to you. And so for this, first is to do a stimulus. We have uh, an intermediary period that can be, for example, three months, one year, what we want. And at the end, we try to see if there is a new or not, a new nutritional phenotype in juvenile. And so to test this, we challenge with an alternative diet, and it's to see if it's possible or not to have a, a, a better use of new ingredients. So this is exactly the type of all the experiment that we are doing. So, oops, why first feeding in fish for the stimulus? It's because during the transition between endogenous to exogenous feeding period, it's a very high level of metabolic plasticity and especially at a molecular level. So it's a stage that can be very useful to do programming. And it's not possible to do something like this in mammals, for example. So it's very interesting. And just, I just want to show you just an example with an enzyme involved in beta oxidation of lipids. And you can see that when you have a transition between endogenous feeding, mixed feeding, exogenous feeding, you have a, here a big, for example, a big decrease of gene expression for this enzyme. And it's true for many, many things. So it's, it's why we, we, we did a paper about uh, the, the ontogenic expression of metabolic gene and some microRNA also in rainbow trout during this transition. And this is why the first feeding is very important and very interesting. So how we can do that? So we focus on first feeding. So all our experiment is to do stimulus in alvin, trout alvin, intermediary period, and to try to, to see if not, if there is a new utilization of, uh, a new type of utilization of diet linked to this stimulus. So for this, we use two different strategies that I want to show you. One is uh, targeted on specific nutrients for specific questions. So I will show you something with carbohydrates. Sorry, I love carbohydrates, so I will show you that. And uh, also we targeted, targeted not on specific nutrients, but on new diet. And we did some experiment with a plant-based diet at first feeding. So <clears throat> for the first uh, example, we fed the larvae with um, with a specific diet. And here, as you can see, what is uh, uh, the meaning of this type of experiment is to do a diet very strange, to do a, a very strong stimulus if it's possible without killing fish. And so, for example, here you have a, a, a classical diet for first feeding <coughs> in rainbow trout with fish meal without any carbohydrates. And here, the second diet that is the stimulus diet is with very low uh, level of fish meal, but very, very high level of carbohydrate, something that is absolutely not good for trout. So we did that to 60% of carbohydrate, and we tried to do that. So of course, the first question is that, is it possible to do that, to do that without any uh, decrease of survival of the fish? So we did that during five days, because we have to choose a timing. So as you can see, we can do many, many different things. But we choose five days up to the total uh, consumption of the vitellus and maybe I forget to see. no it's okay and so when we did the, the stimulus we, we obtained absolutely no negative effect on fish growth later and survival so it was perfect stimulus without any negative consequences so now when you have a stimulus what you want to see is that if you have a stimulus is it work so for to do that we have to test some expression of some enzyme that are involved here, for example, in carbohydrate. And here you can see that for this fish, you have a strong induction of glucokinase, that is a, an enzyme specifically uh, important for the utilization of carbohydrate. 
And you have a decrease of the glucose 6-phosphate as that is the enzyme that controls the reverse reaction. So this is related to different carbohydrate intake. So it seems that the stimulus work. And also, <coughs> we observe here with this enzyme, this biomarker, as explained Jaume yesterday. With uh, this enzyme, we have glutamate dehydrogenase that is involved in, glu in uh, amino acid uh, catabolism. You can have a decrease also with this diet of this enzyme. And this is because, I forget to show you just here, is that this diet has a very strong level of carbohydrate, but also, of course, a very low level of protein. So this is not only with carbohydrate, but also a decrease of protein. And so the decrease of protein is here. So the stimulus work. So after we fed the fish during three months with a controlled diet, the same diet for all the fish. <coughs> and after three months, we challenged the fish during uh, 12 weeks with an alternative diet, rich in carbohydrate. This is this one, not very rich, but rich. 30% is, is high level for trout. And so we wanted to see if there is or not uh, a programming for this fish. So you have to be, be careful. All the fish now are fed with the same diet all the time. So when we did that, we observed that uh, for the growth, for the survival, for the feed efficiency, efficiency for the feed intake, no differences related to the, uh, uh, <clears throat> to the stimulus. So apparently at the beginning, we can say no programming. And so we try and we, we, we analyze the fish. And for example, for the, at the metabolic level, we had a look about glycemia. The first thing that we observed is that there was a difference of glycemia in some group of fish. And the fish that were fed at the beginning during five days with high level of carbohydrates, as uh, three months later, or not, five months later, as higher uh, glycemia level. So here we can say that there is something, but this different to what we expected. So it's also to show you that it's very difficult to do nutritional programming. <coughs> and we are scientists, so we have to say what is the reality. But there is something here. And it's higher glycemia in fish previously fed with carbohydrate. It's not what we expected at the beginning. But it could be linked to the low protein intake. And we know that in mammals, low protein intake during gestation can have a strong effect on regulation of glycemia. And what we observe also is that in muscle, we observe some marker, molecular marker, that are differently expressed between the fish and the stimulus at the beginning of the life of the fish. And we can observe that this hyperglycemia is associated with lower expression of glucose transporter in muscle and glycolysis here, this is three enzymes of glycolysis, and uh, so these two enzymes of glycolysis in muscle. So here you have also at a molecular level a program. So it was very good. And uh, so we can say that nutritional programming of the glucose me metabolism with this type of experiment is, po is possible. We analyze also, it's just to show you some, uh, some of the uh, analyses, we analyze also some uh, microbiota profile. And uh, we observe also <coughs> that uh, in the same fish, that we have, for example, <coughs> modification of the uh, fungi composition in alvin, linked to the stimulus, but also in the juvenile. So also for the microbiota, probably there is also possibility of a programming of the gut microbiota. So all of these data can say that when we use five days feeding with these two type of diet, during only five days, we can have effectively some differences in glucose metabolism in muscle, in gut microbiota, in glycemia also. And so this is why in this paper we wrote this, and the editor speak about this and said, oh, that's very nice to do nutritional programming for this type of fish. But we did, of course, more experimentation, always in IRENA project, and here, we tried to do something because we were very happy, so we said we can say well, we can do many things. So we use the same control diet for the stimulus. You use we used sorry the same uh, diet for the stimulus with high level of starch, so the LP diet. It's here. This is exactly the same. But in this experimentation, we use also a new diet, LPVO diet. So it's very high level of starch plus 
suppression replacement of fish oil by vegetable oil. So to do a double a double stimulus if it's possible or not. So here at first feeling, you have to be clear that there is a new diet, but also there is a new timing. And it was a mistake, I think so, but we did that. And we did not during five days, but, uh, but during 10 days, the stimulus. So when we did that, effectively, we were very happy, no negative effect on fish growth and survival. So for the first feeling, it's really easy to do that with probably with uh, salmon also, but with trout. But with marine fish, it's something that is, can be very difficult. And um, for, the, for the biomarker also of uh, glucose, this is the same of the uh, amino acid catabolism. You can see that there is a big increase of glucokinase, a decrease of glutamate deshydrogenase. So as for the first experiment, effectively, it's possible to do this stimulus without any problem. And at the molecular level, we can observe something that is very clear, similar to the first experiment. We analyze in this experiment also some lipids because of course we have a, a syrup diet with a, a vegetable oil. And here we can see that uh, with this type of, uh, of, uh, of diet, we can say that we have some effect, but not, not very strong, but some effect, for example, for, the, for this enzyme that do you know, very well, elongates. And that's, for example, apparently slightly higher express in fish uh, fed with vegetable oil for the stimulus compared to the, to the, to the other uh, diet. So apparently there is something, but it's a really a minor effect if you compare that to the, to the carbohydrates. So we continue the experiment, exactly the same, three months with a commercial diet. We challenge the fish also during 12 weeks, so the same protocol. But also here we use a, a, a challenge diet that is also different. So this diet is with the same level of carbohydrates, 30%, but we replace fish oil by vegetable oil in this challenge. So as you can see, it's quite similar to the first experiment, but it's not totally similar to the first experiment. And when we did that, we observe absolutely no differences for nothing. So this is clear that here in this experiment, we observe absolutely no programming for, for the growth parameter, for the metabolite, for the intermediary metabolism, for the gene expression, for many things. So it's different if you compare, not this diet, because this diet is a new one, but if you compare the, the two first diet, there is some differences compared to the first experiment. And we don't know why. But this could be due to duration of the stimulus. It's different, as I said to you, five days, 10 days. The challenge diet also here is different or something else. So it's just to show you that it's not so easy and that there is a black box and many things to do in this type of concept. And um, <clears throat> so stimulus at first feeling, we can do it without any problem in Alvin. And that's very nice. With many type of nutrient, we can do it. And uh, uh, to have a new nutritional phenotype, yes, it's possible in the first experiment, but as you can see that it's not systematic. Even if you use the same stimulus diet, but it was not in exactly in the same condition. So may depend of the duration of the stimulus, the ingredient, the challenge, the genetics, I don't know. So it's just to show you, because we have to be honest all the time, that we can do something that is very successful, but not everything. So just to show you that it's something that it can be very complex. And so for the last example, I have, I have the time. Yeah. So for the last example, it's, um, it's to, to do the stimulus, not with carbohydrate or something like this, but with a plant-based diet. So <clears throat> just to show you that we, we published this, uh, the first part of this uh, uh, experiment with Inge, <clears throat> and, and plus one, just to show you that a short-term uh, exposure of the fight to plant-based diet improves its acceptance and utilization at later life stage. So I will show you this phenotype, what is it exactly? So what we did, and what we try also to, to understand is what can be the mechanism for that. So what we did is that we fed fish, so we yeah, are first feeding, not doing 10 days, but doing three weeks. And we fed this fish with a marine diet or with a vegetable diet. Vegetable diet, no fish meal and no fish oil. You have this here. So marine diet with fish oil, fish meal, and vegetable diet without any fish oil and fish meal. So we fed the, the alvin during uh, 
doing uh, three weeks. And here, but it's not the subject of the talk today, we use also three different families of cars. So it's uh, just to have a, an idea of the genetics. But it's, uh, it's, not, uh, <clears throat> it's not very important for this talk. It can be very important, but not for this talk. So when we did that, after we had an intermediary period, not during three months, but seven months, and we tried to challenge the fish at the end, the other <coughs> fish, with exactly the same diet that they have at the beginning of their life. So to know, is it possible for this type of fish, seven months later, to remember that here he, he was fed with a vegetable diet? So to do that, so this is the question, is there or not a long-term effect associated with this early life, uh, early nutritional history? So just to describe the first, the phenotype and the animal. So if there is or not a long-term effect. So just to show you our air, that so we are, okay, we are at the end, which is the challenge. So we, and the fish are fed uh, with a vegetable diet. Okay, all the fish. Here in green, it's fish that was fed previously during three weeks at first feeding with vegetable diet and in blue with marine diet. And you can see here, and here, it, this is the first family, the second family, the third family of carp. And you can have just a look about this, or if you combine everything. And if you combine everything, and you can see that effectively there is a differences in feed intake <coughs> related to the first feeding during three weeks in this fish. And you can see also, but it's not a, the subject, that there is a big differences between the fish line, but it's not the subject. But you can see that there is, uh, 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 higher feed intake in this fish. <clears throat> the fish, feed efficiency also was modified related to the uh, history and the, the stimulus of the first feeding, as you can see here. And so the result of the, the challenge show positive long-term effect of the nutritional history when the fish were fed with vegetable diet. <clears throat> so this is very positive. So the question was here, so first feeding, three weeks, seven months, and here we did the, the test, the challenge. As you can see, the body weight of the fish was increased by 200%. And here we observe something that is related to this. So it's why, is it adaptation, nutritional programming, what mechanism can be related to that? So this is why we did some analysis, <clears throat> a short-term effect here, Alvin, molecular analysis to know if there is using omics approach to know if there is some differences here and to know, of course, what is the most interesting for the study is to see if there is here some differences that can explain the different phenotype and feed intake and feed efficiency or something like this, if you have some marker. So we use an uh, omics approach and we use here two different tissue, liver because this is the center of the intermediary metabolism and it's very important to know if there is some differences in liver and in brain, because we wanted to see also, to focus some of our analysis in feed intake, and we know that brain is very important for the feed intake. So we did this analysis, uh, and uh, here it's just to show you that when we analyze the, the effect of the stimulus, so with this omic approach, you can see that, as expected, after three weeks, <coughs> between a, a fish fed with a marine diet or vegetable diet, there is a big difference for many things. It's not so surprising. But it is clear, and here you can see that you have more, for example, to 17,000 probes that are differently expressed between these two types of algae. So it's, it's not surprising because it's a very strong stimulus. So it's, a, as you know, if we fed even trout with a, a first feeding with vegetable diet, it's quite difficult for them. And <clears throat> when we wanted to see if, uh, at long term what is the, exactly the, the situation, when we analyze the brain, we observe also that there is, as you can see, high level of gene expression that are differently expressed, even after seven months. And these genes in brain, just to show you that here, is, this is a representation that we can do with a mini different uh, for the gene and the compilation, you know, it's doing that by some software. And for example, here, you have many things with the lactate deshydrogenase. And, uh, and uh, so here, this is the, the global genes that are overexpressed, done regulated, for example, in fish fed with plant-based diet at the beginning. So here it's for adult fish. Huh? And so we observe that there is some differences in, for the sensory perception in brain, 
for the synaptic transmission, for the methylation, for the appetite control neuropathic. So something that can be very interesting effectively for the regulation of feed intake, for example. And here is just to show you what is it exactly when you said that we have some many genes differently expressed. You can see that here you have a relation between all these genes that, are, uh, that we observe with the differences. So this is just for the interpretation of the data. So we did the same with the liver. And we, with the liver, we obtain uh, some genes, but less genes compared to the to brain that are differently expressed. And as you can see here, so all of, uh, you cannot see that here, but just to show you that the genes that are uh, differently expressed are the genes involved in metabolism, xenobiotic, intermediary, we expected that, but also xenobiotic gene expression, uh, the genes involved in protein turnover and also in cytoskeleton. So we have many genes that are also differently expressed after seven months uh, after the stimulus. So the conclusion here is that here in say, we can have several pathways in juvenile brain and liver that are differently expressed by the first feeding. And uh, <clears throat> this can explain, at least during the challenge, so the challenge was relatively short, but during the challenge, that they can explain the differences that we observe for the phenotype. Just to show you that uh, we have some differences in liver that are exactly the same that we can observe in adult fish when we fed them with vegetable diet and marine diet. Those, some of the genes are exactly the same, difference of expression, but some are also totally reversed. So just to show you that there is something that, it's, uh, that is not easy to, to understand at first. And um, <clears throat> so this work is just to, to one more time to say that the first feeding stage in this type of fish can be very interesting to, to, to be used for, for test the nutritional program. So, and just to finish, I think, just to not to have too much time. So the conclusion uh, is that uh, the proof of the concept of nutrition programming with diet at first feeding, at least in worm bowl rat, is, is okay. It's possible to do it. But this is also true for other fish species, not in Arena with Marisol, but also with, uh, with Sofia. Some experiment has been done with Sibrim, Sibas, and, uh, and we know that it's possible with zebra fish in the literature and also with Sofia. And also maybe in salmon, we don't know for the moment, but maybe we can do something. So of course, many different type of question can be after that. Uh, you can see it's after the analysis because we have many things to do before probably is the question of uh, is it possible to have this phenotype that can be transmitted generation by generation and we know that it's possible at least in, uh, in, in uh, some mammal studies with epigenetics some epigenetics maps can be transmitted to the first to the second generation and um, <clears throat> of course we have different type of uh, uh, developmental windows that can be used also some interaction with different genotypes that can be very, very interesting. So this is a huge work, you know, for many, many PhD students, for example. Right? And so, but be careful before application in aquaculture. It can be very useful. It can be very easy to do because you have just to do, for example, a stimuli with a specific diet. But as you can see, we, it's, it's, not, it's very, very difficult to drive, to pilot the program. So for the moment, it's something that is, is uh, uh, too complex to be sure. And just to know, so it's, it's absolutely necessary to better understand what are the mechanism behind this phenotype that we can have. So the mechanism can be linked to the tissue formation because it's not only epigenetics. Tissue formation is just to show you that, for example, in mammal, if you fed the, uh, 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 the mother with a low protein diet, you will have programming of the, of the children. But the programming is not related to epigenetics, it's only, but it's very important, related to differences on the differentiation of the pancreas for all the life. So you will have a specific pancreas related to the gestation, you know? This is programming also. But also, um, of course, one of the main mechanisms involved in, in programming is related to epigenetics. So just for all the people, for some people that doesn't know, is that epigenetics, we have no modification of the genetic. The only modification is related to some marks that we can have on the genome. And two main type of marks, it's DNA methylation, so the methylation of DNA. And when you have methylation of DNA, for example, you have regression of gene expression. 
And you have also you know, a lot of different histone modification. So linked to the methylation, acetylation. And this, modifi this histone modification can repress or induce gene expression. It's like a, it's something that is a very, uh, very, very complex, but very, very interesting to be studied. So of course, we can have many things like this. So we, we are beginning to study about epigenetics. But if you want to study epigenetics, something that is very important also to know is that you know you must know the genome and the genome sequence. If it is not the case, it's not possible to do except global epigenetics. But if you want to, to observe some modification of epigenetics marks for these genes or something, something like this, you need to have the sequence of, of, the, of the genome. So here it's just with trout, we have the sequence um, one year ago. Uh, but for many, many fish now, we will have, uh, and we have for other fish, such as salmon, for example, the sequence of the genome. But it's uh, very important to do this type of analysis. So that's it. So it's uh, just uh, an arrangement of the people in, uh, in, uh, in Sampe involved in, uh, in this uh, experimentation. So the, the researcher and, uh, of course, the technician, the people in the, in the fish farm, and also some people in Ifremer, because we are working also about this with uh, our colleague in Brest. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just a question. Have you ever uh, uh, tried the next generation, like an uh, F1, F2, to see which of these traits in the epigenetics can be also have uh, can also have inheritance to the uh, next generation? Because with the previous example on the previous presentation with the delta six desaturase, that the larvae had the ability uh, in the gene expression because the parents were fed another diet. Have you tried anything on the F2? No. But what is also important is that if you want to see it, there's two things. The transgenerational transmission is different to the multi-generational transmission. And if you want to observe something for it, we, we didn't do anything about this. If you want to observe something, in the, you, you must go to the F2 and probably F3. So you see it, and this is also very important because sometimes there is a confusion between the two types of uh, the analysis. So if you want to be sure that there is a uh, uh, persistence of epigenetic marks linked to the transmission uh, with the gametes and many things, it's possible, but you have to do a big experiment. And this is why with our fish in aquaculture, it can be at the beginning very difficult because you have to wait a lot of time. And uh, probably the main fish model to do that is, uh, for example, zebra fish, because you can do many things. And uh, so that's it. But we don't do anything about this. But it's, I'm sure that it can be very interesting. The temperature? It's uh, <clears throat> because we have uh, some uh, some uh, experimental farm with a constant temperature during all the all the year. So, for example, for the experiment uh, here that I show you at the, uh, for the first video up to the end, it's uh, 17, 17 degrees. It's it's constant all the year. That's it's it's very good because uh, we have no interaction with temperature. Because, for example, as a stimuli, you can have also. Uh, and I know that there is some work about this with temperature. This temperature can be a stimulus, and uh, epoxy can be a stimulus, and many things like this, you know? So that's uh, environment, and nutrition, of course. Coffee break? Yes. <laughs>
with Rafa uh, the last today this is probably got fresh taste and it's mine so we need the the last half of the whole cube to analyze <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, as we were saying, uh, today we will see uh, the effect of uh, the feeding brewstock with uh, uh, low fish oil uh, diets in this case on the uh, effect of the progeny along the whole uh, life cycle. And uh, first of all, we will try to uh, make a short uh, revision of the importance of uh, brewstock nutrition. Um, I know that some of you have been uh, working with uh, Brewstock Nutrition. Uh, indeed, Christine has been working for many years in Brewstock Nutrition as well. And we have some interesting papers together. Uh, but some uh, of you also prepared your own diets. How many of you have been working with Brewstock Nutrition? Okay, yes, sure. Ellen, I'm sorry. She has been also working a lot. Yes, in that as well. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, but among the, the, the other participants, not, not so many apparently have been studying uh, Brewster Nutrition. Uh, working on Brewster Nutrition is a bit complicated because uh, uh, we need uh, large facilities to keep the Brewster on different diets and because the, that, this is uh, expensive and the amount of diets that we have to produce also sometimes and the size of the diet is very large. So it is a little bit complicated, but it is very important because even if we are able to control spawning by hormonal uh, manipulation or by environmental parameters manipulation and and uh, if we want to even if we want to have breeding programs if we do not have a proper diet we will not be able to see the benefits of uh, uh, selective breeding or the benefits of uh, uh, control spawning uh, because everything will be spoiled by the uh, by the poor quality of the feeds. Therefore, uh, brewstock nutrition is quite important. So for those of you uh, participants, not teachers, that have been working uh, or with brewstock, uh, what are the main, uh, the most important ingredients that are being used for, uh, for brewstock nutrition? Or what are ingredients that, uh, that can be uh, important for brewstock nutrition? Somebody knows? Like fish meal, fish oil, okay. Vitamins, but a specific ingredients? Astaxanthin, omega-3. Okay, astaxanthin, omega-3, vitamins. We are talking about nutrients, but I am asking about ingredients. Sure, yes? Essential amino acids, that's also a nutrient. Ingredients, uh, what do we have to put in the diet to make our fish to uh, be able to reproduce well? Uh, there are some, yes, what? Shellfish, for instance, yes, some people use shellfish. A very common, uh, there are some very, very uh, common ingredients that have been used in Brewster Nutrition. One of them is squid meal. Has been, it, it's very, uh, even in the early 80s, uh, there were some studies that show that is uh, able, we are able to promote the reproduction of the fish by feeding them with fish meat. And many, <clears throat> many uh, uh, hatcheries, for instance, used to uh, supplement also the diet with a, a squid, a live squid, for instance, or cuttlefish, and also with, uh, um, for instance, uh, crabs or, uh, or different types of uh, uh, crustaceans, uh, sometimes krill and so on. Um, so, uh, yes, there are some very important uh, ingredients that are used in, in brewstock feeding. 
like fish, squid, mussel, and, and krill. Uh, as always, we say, nevertheless, we should uh, use formulated feeds to feed uh, our blue stock because otherwise it's very easy to transfer pathogens uh, that are not uh, desirable. So uh, there have been uh, several studies trying to determine not only which ingredients are important for broodstock diets, as we said, squid, mollusk fish, grilled, and so on, but also, uh, more importantly, what are the nutritional factors that are in, this, uh, in these ingredients that, are, that have this property of improving uh, reproduction. So for instance, in, in the, the squid meal or in the squid itself, apparently the quality of the protein, and not apparently, there has been some studies, and we also have conducted some studies, uh, where we have seen that the protein quality of the, of the squid is, is very good, and even the type of amino acids and the uh, type of um, proteins have been studied and have been determining uh, that this is one of the important nutritional factors in, in a squid meat. And this is important because, as we said yesterday, seen, or the day before, since the fish do not require ingredients but require uh, nutrients, if we identify what are the important nutritional factors, we will be able to make our own diets without being dependent completely on those ingredients. And this is also what we are trying to do. I uh, remember when I started to work in, uh, in Rustop diets, that was like uh, year 88 or something like that, uh, there were not really proper um, uh, Brewstop diets in the market. What the companies used to sell as Brewstop diets used to be big diets. That was, big size diet. And uh, some different uh, research groups in uh, Europe and in Asia and in the States have been uh, uh, trying to demonstrate what are the requirements of the brewstock, and from that moment, the uh, feed producers have been trying to uh, prepare and make better uh, brewstock diets. And indeed, nowadays we have better, much better brewstock diets. But the problem is that we don't have specific brewstock diets for each different uh, type of fish. Usually we have uh, high protein diets or high squid meal diets or high omega-3 diets. So still we need a little bit more uh, knowledge, but the diets are much, much better, uh, and we have been able to prove that for many years. Um, okay, so some of the old studies uh, show, what, for instance, that uh, usually uh, protein content is very important in broodstock diets, and here are some of the studies uh, conducted in different countries and in different species that show that the content of protein in the diet is uh, relatively high for the blue stock diets, higher than for growing. Mm -hmm. Last year, I'm not going to show you some results because still we are processing, but last year we conducted one experiment with uh, amberjack, and the protein content is very important for amberjack, but we found something. We found that specific amino acids are very important for the reproduction of the amberjack. So perhaps these high requirements that we found here in proteins are also uh, being affected by high, uh, by uh, too low uh, amino acid levels or specific amino acid levels in this, uh, in this, in the diets. In generally speaking, so generally speaking, as uh, we said, for these uh, requirements for proteins for blue stock are around uh, uh, 35 percent for herbivorous fish. fish. 45 for carnivorous fish. There have been few studies on minerals, but uh, phosphorus and selenium have been found to be essential for uh, reproduction of, uh, of uh, aquaculture fish. And nucleotides also seem to be uh, beneficial, but there are, studies, there are very few studies on the effect of uh, uh, nucleotides for bluestock. Now, some uh, interesting studies were conducted by Gonzalez Vecino and, and co-workers, in this case on uh, haddock, and, for instance, they supplemented uh, the feed of the brewstock with nucleotides, and they saw that there was a better, uh, a better quality of the reproduction in terms of number of eggs uh, per spawning uh, per gram of uh, per spawning per gram of a female. But uh, mm, there are still many uh, mm, many nutrients that must be very important, but we don't know uh, very well yet. Uh, the 
required uh, the requirement for these nutrients. For instance, uh, there are very few studies with water soluble diets. We have seen uh, that uh, uh, the animals may require folic acid, as it is also very important for uh, for different um, um, tissues along uh, development, as we know also in other vertebrates. Also, folic acid is an important epigenetic uh, factor. Uh, thiamine, there are some also some uh, studies, uh, and it has been seen that uh, thiamine is uh, high in the eggs of the salmonids. And uh, when we inject uh, uh, the females with thia uh, thiamine, there is an increase in enough spring survival. Uh, carotenoids are very important. We know that uh, from a long time ago in different species, it all started in red cibrin, but also in the head cibrin, we, we were able to see that carotenoid as well as, uh, as other nutrients such as vitamin E, uh, their um, amount in the diet can be also related with the levels of uh, omega-3 or long-chain uh, uh, polyisotropic fatty acids in the diet. Uh, of course, but tocopherol, the vit is a very important vitamin for reproduction um, for the development of the embryo and is also uh, required in interesting amounts. Well, that's only to show some results of some uh, <coughs> The studies we have conducted with a little bit of addition of uh, folic acid, and we saw that there was an increase in the viable eggs and the hatch uh, larvae that we that we obtained. Uh, regarding the, the essential fatty acids uh, like uh, eicosapentaenoic acid, docosahexaenoic acid, and also uh, arachidonic acid, are uh, very important uh, as precursors of uh, eicosanoids and docosanoids, and they are very important. Uh, not only for the um, not only for the development of the embryo, as we well know, but to also, of course, for the production of these uh, metabolic compounds that can be acting also as pheromones. And for instance, in the case of gilgit cibrim, uh, the pheromones are very important to coordinate the spawning or the, the gametogenesis in male and female. So it's uh, very important that they have the correct balance in between all these three amino acids. Uh, in order to produce the correct uh, types of uh, eicosanoids or docosanoids to, uh, 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 to match, to uh, coordinate the uh, development of the gametogenesis in both male and female, and most important, the spawning. So the requirements uh, for these uh, fatty acids for uh, freshwater fish are around uh, 1%, whereas in sparrows, for instance, we have seen that depending on the species and on the on the diet as well, it can range from 1.5 to 2.5. But this high amount of, uh, of um, omega-3 also uh, mm, re makes the diet to require uh, uh, antioxidant protection. Okay, well, that this is only just an uh, example of uh, many other studies that have been conducted where we had here different uh, levels <coughs> different uh, le le dietary levels of omega-3 UFA, for instance, and how uh, we uh, see the effect on the, uh, in this case, embryo survival of either the larvae uh, at, after three days after hatching or post-hatching and the, uh, the uh, percentage of normal uh, embryos. Uh, probably you are going to talk about this, all these quality parameters in the practice this afternoon. Because Elin is an expert in, in, in this. Okay, so we have seen that uh, when we increase the amount of uh, omega 3 in the diet of uh, um, N3 um, long change UFA, we have seen that there is an increase in these uh, parameters. There, are, there is a higher number, markedly higher number, of normal embryos and a higher number also of uh, larva, larvae, uh, so larval survival. Okay, some of these uh, studies uh, have been summarized in a, well, uh, not so old uh, 2011 uh, review that Christine and uh, the group of Christine and myself and uh, IMR uh, were doing and is published in, uh, in a book. And also regarding nervous nutrition, uh, Christine has also made a very nice uh, 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 review uh, published in 2013. Okay, so uh, we know then that uh, uh, that the um, 
blue stock uh, nutrients or the nutrients for the blue stock are able to markedly affect their reproduction success. But are going, uh, is it possible that uh, these nutrients will affect the animal for the rest uh, of their lives? And uh, will, if you ask to the, to the fish farmers, they will say yes, always they say yes, because they always say that sometimes when they have problems in the, in the production, in the farm, they believe it's because the quality of the fry was not good. And, and frequently, it's very easy to, to blame some, some, some other one, Carlos. And uh, frequently, uh, they believe that it's because uh, perhaps the broodstock management or the broodstock diet, or there can be some problem. Uh, but there are very, really, very, very, very few studies that have shown that the diet of the blue stock would affect the performance of the animal for the rest of their life, or at least for the rest of the productive uh, uh, period, of the ongoing period, for instance. So, uh, yeah, we were trying to answer uh, these questions. How long will the feeding of the blue stock be reflected on the fish performance? How long will the feeding of the larvae be reflected on fish performance? And this was the, uh, Stefan was trying to answer this question this morning uh, as well. And how relevant is hatchery nutrition for the long-term performance of fish in the farms? So uh, we have seen that uh, we need to, as we have been discussing in Arrayna and we have been discussing during this uh, whole course, that uh, we need to, uh, if possible, completely remove, or as much as we can, fish meal and fish oil uh, for the sustainable development of aquaculture and the production of uh, aquafits. But uh, perhaps not only we can try to uh, reduce fish meal and fish oil in these diets without affecting the growth of the fish, but perhaps we can also prepare the fish to be able to better utilize these diets low in fish meal and fish oil. And there are different, oops, different uh, methods we could do that have been approached, like uh, to select the strains that are uh, better able to utilize uh, low fish meal fish oil diets, or even genetically modified uh, organisms, which in Europe is not uh, accepted, or the modulation of the phenotype, as, uh, um, as Stefan has been uh, working and, and his group has been working and has been doing. But uh, the um, persistent, as uh, he has uh, explained today, the persistent modifications of the phenotype uh, um, uh, conditioning during sensitive windows along uh, development, it's uh, part of the epigenetics. And okay, I think he has been already explaining you the different methods which are uh, affecting epigenetics, so I'm not going to enter on that, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on how through blue stock nutrition we can affect, uh, we can modulate the phenotype of the animal or we can modulate the acceptance of the low fish meal and low fish oil diets uh, by the animal along uh, the life cycle. Um, we started to be more interested on focusing on the blue stock nutrition than on the larvae or juvenile nutrition uh, because indeed, uh, I don't know, Stefan, have you uh, talk about the Dutch hunger today? Okay, so you, I will not explain it again. This is only one of the reasons that we thought if in other uh, vertebrates, uh, the bruce top, the feeding of the parents is so important, not only in, in mammals, but it has been seen also in some other, uh, in some other uh, vertebrates, then we think perhaps we could uh, affect uh, uh, the phenotype of the offspring by modulating, by changing the diets of the parents. So, uh, of course, I don't know if I have said before, but one of my main interests in my research life has been fatty acids. So everything I relate with fatty acids. And I am uh, quite uh, happy to know that uh, fatty acids uh, are uh, very important or have important uh, roles in some other uh, animals, it has been seen, that are important, uh, have important epigenetic uh, regulation uh, functions. So uh, one of the problems, as uh, uh, Douglas has explained uh, in, during the first days, 
one of the problems that particularly marine fish have to utilize uh, um, uh, low fish meal fish oil diets is that they are not so able as we could wish to uh, transform the precursors uh, the linoleic and linolenic acid into long chain uh, fatty acids long chain uh, PUFA well uh, we have seen a, a little bit in Douglas talk that uh, in the salmonids uh, they are they have this uh, ability of regulation and indeed uh, it's uh, uh, it's what we should uh, have been uh, expecting uh, but uh, perhaps oops, we can um, uh, perhaps we can uh, try to through the blue stock nutrition to modulate the ability of the fish to utilize these fatty acids so as you know uh, in the case of uh, marine fish uh, we have to include in the diet and that's what we always said to include in the diet dha docosahexanoic acid eicosapentanoic acid and arachidonic acid and uh, some uh, freshwater fish or salmonid fish have a slightly higher ability than uh, marine fish to uh, produce these fatty acids from the precursors 18.2 and 6 and 18.3 and, 18, and C. <coughs> uh, but uh, in the case of the marine fish, this uh, ability uh, seems to be more restricted up to what uh, we knew. So what uh, we would like is to see if we can uh, be in some way uh, able to make the fish to marine fish to utilize better uh, these precursors to convert them into these uh, uh, essential uh, long chain uh, fatty acids and uh, uh, for that we know uh, nowadays thanks to some studies of uh, uh, Stefan and uh, some other co-workers that in the case of the sebrim, there, there are the genes that are able, the um, uh, fatty acid desaturase 2, or the genes that are, uh, or delta 6, delta 5, like the desaturase genes, that are able to uh, produce these long chain uh, polysaturated fatty acids from the precursors 18.2 and 18.3, which are present in the vegetable oils. We also conducted some study on uh, larvae where we fed the larvae either with a, a diet that was uh, low in um, omega-3 UFA uh, or high in omega-3 UFA and we checked the expression of this fatty acid desaturase 2 and uh, we saw that there was it was possible to upregulate or downregulate uh, the expression of this enzyme by modulation through the diet and similar results we also got in a RAFOA project uh, when we fed the juveniles with uh, either fish oil, and you see that there is an inhib inhibition of the expression of this enzyme, whereas the expression of the enzyme is promoted when we increase the levels of the precursors uh, in the diet, which are the uh, 18.2 and 18.3 fatty acids. So as I was mentioning, uh, in other animals, uh, PUFA have uh, important epigenetic properties, and for instance, the uh, cell-specific metabolism and the expression of uh, uh, fatty acid uh, regulated transcription factors play a very important role in determining how the cells respond to changes in the, in the diet uh, of the PUFA or in the tissue uh, PUFA content. Um, now, as I said before, working with the broodstock of uh, aquaculture <laughs> fish is uh, very expensive and is uh, also a little bit complicated. The most complicated part for us, we were developing through the years uh, some methodology to be able to determine specifically the effect of the nutrients on each female. The problem that we have is that when we work with sebrim, we usually work with batches of uh, fish. We cannot uh, work or we cannot uh, uh, strip the sebrim to get the eggs and to get the, um, uh, to get the milk. Uh, to uh, uh, make the fecundation of the eggs. It's a, it's a bit complicated. So we wanted to have a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous spawning in the gilhead sibrin. Uh, we were able to obtain a spawning of gilhead sibrin in tanks where we put only one female and two males. And uh, we were able to see in this way, we, it's very good because 
GitHead Cbrim has uh, three months of spawning. And what we have been doing is developing in this method for the first month of spawning, uh, we check that the quality, the spawning quality of each female is not different, is the same. For instance, I may have 20 tanks with 20 females, one female in each tank, and 40 males, two males per each female. And I check during the first month that there is no difference in, in the spawning quality, that they, all of them had the same amount of eggs per kilogram female for each spawn, and the quality is similar. And uh, if one of them is not, I change it. And after these months, I can uh, change the diet, and in two weeks, two or three weeks, depending on the type of nutrient that I am working with, in two or three weeks, I will see a change in the quality of the, of the spawn that will be affected by the nutrient. Okay, so this is a nice uh, method, but in this method, I cannot compare or I cannot study the effect of the food on the male and on the female. I have to feed the three of them the same. This is why we developed a model to make some epigenetic studies, and this was the uh, seahorse. Um, in, uh, in here, we have uh, two species of uh, seahorses that we use for the uh, uh, wild uh, population recovery. And this was a very nice, a very nice um, video, but I think uh, it doesn't work, so I'll show you later on. But the important thing is to know this is our species. And I can get this uh, fish spawns only or mates only with one uh, couple for uh, most of, of its life. So uh, they make couples that uh, live together many years, and I can have two of them in the same aquarium. And uh, they, uh, um, what we were trying, what we were doing, is we were feeding different food to the male and female. They were both together in the aquarium, but with a pipette, we were feeding uh, the, the female, or we were feeding the male with different diets. And then we tested two diets one high in uh, omega-3 PUFA <coughs> and another one low in omega-3 PUFA. And we combined. So we fed, for instance, the male with a high UFA and the female with high UFA, the male with high UFA and the female with low UFA, and so on, all the, all the different combinations. And we found interesting results. Uh, what do you think that we found? Somebody, give me some cue. What have you found? What's the effect of the, if I give uh, to the female low UFA, would I have a better spawn or a worse spawn? Yes. Worse, of course. And this is what we have got. But what is more important is that when we fed the males with either high UFA or low UFA, we found very strict differences. So the effect is not only by what we put into the, into the egg. The effect is only coming from the male in different ways. In, the, in this sense, there were some very nice studies done uh, with uh, trout in the 80s as well in uh, the effect of feed in the male. Okay, so this is what we have got and, uh, and it was interesting. Uh, here I have the two types of food. W is high UFA, C is uh, low uh, UFA. And this is the male diet and this is the female diet. So, for instance, these two bars represent, in this case, the length of the seahorse when it was just hatched out, the length of the seahorse that was fed, uh, where the females were fed with low UFA. So low UFA for the females, low uh, growth or low size for the offspring, and the same for the tail length with two different determinations. And uh, what it was interesting is that, in this case, uh, when the both females were fed with a high UFA, when we fed the male with low UFA, the results were significantly higher than if the uh, male was also fed good or high UFA. And we, did, we conducted this study in several uh, occasions, and we always found this, and this was a little bit uh, stricken for us, but in some way, this is suggesting that when we fed the male with low UFA, we are in some way preparing the offspring for a bad uh, situation. And if 
uh, the uh, offspring in the egg has the uh, has the um, omega-3 coming from the female, it will util utilize better this omega-3 to grow better. So that was a very interesting uh, study. After that, we conducted uh, several others to know exactly in which moment uh, the male was affecting. Um, well, anyway, just show us that it is possible to affect and both, uh, and both are important. But uh, we found something also more interesting here is when we fed the females with low, uh, with low omega-3, uh, the females and the mates with low omega-3, there was also a malformation in the mouth. This is the mouth of a normal offspring of seahorse, just hatch out, not hatch out, just giving birth. And this is the one of a female that was fed with a low uh, UFA diet. And, and these animals, were, their predation was worse and they died very quickly. Okay, we found also differences, <clears throat> of course, in the con contents of the omega-3 in the diet. I'm not going to uh, focus more on that because uh, we have to talk about different things. And uh, these studies have been uh, published in the Reproduction, Fertility and Development and different uh, publications. Okay, so we knew by this that we are able to affect phenotyping and to affect even the morphology of the animal by feeding the parents not only by, uh, by giving <clears throat> a new, different nutrients in the egg, but, but just by the feeding of the uh, parents with the different, uh, uh, with different diets. And uh, so uh, probably uh, you have seen also that uh, there are along the life of the fish in this case, uh, there are specific moments uh, gametogenesis, the fertilization, what is called the preconception in vertebrates, the moment around the fertilization, uh, the hatching or the poverty, where uh, the, uh, these uh, developmental windows are very sensitive to uh, um, external uh, or internal signals, such as differences in the nutrient availability, that will make the animal to prepare for this uh, to, to prepare to overcome uh, this type of problems later in, in life. Uh, okay, so our hypothesis was to see if by feeding the broodstock uh, with the specific diets, we could be able to uh, produce uh, juveniles that uh, would be able to perform better, in this case, when they were fed plant oils. And then later on, we tested different things. So uh, this is what we wanted to answer. Is it feasible, the early programming of Seabrim, for a better utilization of vegetable oils during on growing? And for that, uh, we utilized uh, nutrients in uh, uh, omega-3 in the diets, different types and levels, as we will see, but also uh, vitamin E, because it's also in mammal epigenetic models, it has been seen that it's a, a factor involved in the histone <coughs> Uh, acetylation and deacetylation. So uh, uh, the first study that we did uh, three year, years ago or four years ago, it was to see the uh, reproductive performance of fish fed different levels of linseed oils and tocopherol. Why linseed oil? Because it has the precursor of the long change uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So we fed the, in this case, we fed the broodstock with three different types of diets with one diet with 100% fish oil, one diet with 80% uh, linseed oil, and one diet that had 80% uh, linseed oil plus vitamin E. And uh, as, uh, um, in this case, as you can see, the fish oil will have the long change PUFA, whereas the linseed oil will provide the precursors, and only 20% of fish oil was in this diet. We follow it after feeding the brew stock, we followed a commercial protocol until the fish was, uh, in this case, uh, three months. And then we made a challenge where we fed this fish, um, changing again only the oils, feeding them with fish oil, 80% linseed oil, or even 100% linseed oil. And along the whole uh, period, until uh, they were five months old, we, uh, we controlled or we uh, monitorized 
road feed utilization with conducted nutritional studies, metabolic uh, studies, and the genetic studies, gene expression studies. So uh, the first thing we saw, this is the number of eggs produced per kilogram female per spawn when, uh, when fish were fed 100% uh, fish oil and when fish was fed 80% linseed oil. This was what we could have expected because this fish is being fed a diet which is efficient in uh, omega-3. Um, so, and there was a stricken uh, reduction. But we wanted to see what happened with the progeny later. Oh, sorry, with the offspring later on. And what it was interesting is that when we uh, increased the vitamin E uh, levels, there wasn't any, there wasn't that uh, so strong uh, problem, which can be also related not only with a lack of omega-3, but in this diet, but also with the pro-oxidative effect of uh, linolenic acid, which is present in the linseed oils. But the, what the important thing is that there was uh, this reduction. So uh, we also uh, check not only the total amount of eggs, but the percentage of viable eggs, as uh, Ellen will tell you later on, and the uh, percentage of fertilized eggs and the hatching rates. There were not very different in hatching rates and the larval uh, survival. So uh, definitely the quality of the sperms uh, was affected, as it could be uh, as, it, as it could be expected. But then we follow it, as I said, until they were three months old. And the first thing we saw is we followed the larvae uh, at the day seven, day 15, and day 30. And we found that there was, uh, uh, after 30 days, and this we have seen consistently during three different uh, years, uh, that there was a higher growth, uh, or there was a growth reduction when we include the vitamin E, uh, increased vitamin E levels in the diet of the broodstock. So in any case, during the larval stages, which is more or less what we could expect, uh, even until day 30, there was uh, some effect of the broodstock diet on the larvae. And at this age, we also checked, the in trying to understand what was happening in the larvae, we also checked, for instance, the expression of the fatty acid desaturase uh, 2. And we can see that uh, this is the expression of this gene, which is uh, uh, important for the synthesis of uh, long chain uh, PUFA um, from the precursors present in the vegetable oils. We saw that there was a tendency to overexpress when we use a high contents of linseed oil, so high contents of the precursor and low of the product, which are the uh, long chain PUFA. And on the contrary, when we add vitamin E in this larvae, there was an inhibition of this uh, enzyme, of this, sorry, gene, uh, which is regulating this enzyme. And uh, well, uh, there, there are some studies uh, suggesting also that vitamin E can affect uh, the uh, expression of this uh, gene. So uh, parental feeding with vitamin E is reflected in the 30-day-old progeny. Uh, gene expression and uh, the fatty acid, uh, fatty acid desaturase 2 gene in this uh, larvae is down regulated by parental feeding with vitamin E and other genes were also affected I have I will not uh, show them today I will show later on but not uh, so much but what is important is when the uh, animals were uh, three months old uh, we fed these were animals that were mm, in blue always were animals whose parents were fed fish oil. These are animals whose parents were fed linseed oil. And these are animals whose parents were fed linseed oil plus vitamin E. And what we could see is that when to these fish we fed them, we made a, a, a feeding trial, a specific feeding trial, and we found that there was a higher uh, growth in fish whose parents were fed linseed oil, uh, which was also uh, clear when we fed the fish with linseed oil itself, with the juveniles, and here with 100% uh, linseed oil. So uh, certainly, even after uh, five months uh, of uh, commercial feeding, when we made this uh, feeding challenge, we found that there was an effect, a significant effect of the broodstock feeding. Five months in this case. So we wanted to progress a little bit more on this. Now we know that in seabream it is possible, that it's possible to make them grow faster if we modify the diet of the broodstock, but we need to uh, know a little bit better because we don't want to cause 
the, uh, the negative effects on the spawning, but we want to have the positive effects on the juveniles. So we thought in using, well, different approaches, but in this case, I'm going to present you an approach where we tested different levels, different combinations of fish, fish oil and linseed oil, trying to see which is the best combination that without giving you problems in the spawning, will give you uh, animals that will be able to utilize better fish meal, in this case, fish meal and fish oil. Okay, so uh, the um, scheme is slightly different. In this case, we fed the animals either with 100% fish oil, 60% linseed oil, so we reduced uh, a little bit the amount of linseed oil, 80% linseed oil, and 100% linseed oil. Uh, again, only they deferred in the feeding of the broodstock, and the rest of the time they were fed a commercial protocol until they, they were, uh, again, in uh, three months old, uh, approximately. And at that moment, we fed them, in this case, with a diet 100% fish meal, fish oil, and with a diet that was only 5% fish meal and 6% fish oil. That is one of the diets that, I, that we have been testing in a, in a right now. So really low in fish meal and uh, some way low in fish oil uh, as well. And we saw and we tried to see what, what happened. Um, okay, so uh, this is the composition of the diets and you can see that in the diets, the amount of linoleic and linolenic acid, which are the precursors, were being increased, but the amount of the products that were the EPA and DHA were being uh, reduced. So to see the effect of these diets uh, on, the, on the animals. This is the spawning. This is the total number of eggs produced per kilogram female. This is the total uh, number of uh, fertilized eggs. This is the uh, number of viable eggs, hatch, lar hatch larvae and larvae at three day old. So you can see that uh, there is some reduction in the total number of eggs produced uh, when we fed the diets, uh, the broodstock with diets containing 40% fish oil, 60% linseed oil. But when we use, again, as we saw in the previous study, when we use higher levels of linseed oil, the um, quality of the eggs is much worse very, very, uh, very differently worse. And uh, when we follow the uh, larval development, we saw that at day 45, there were significant differences between uh, the lowest, I'm sorry, didn't appear here, but between the uh, highest linseed oil uh, diet content in the broodstock, that was, uh, and the highest growth was in the animals that were fed 100% uh, fish oil. Okay, the colors are always uh, blue is all, always for fish meal and the more, more, and more green or green brownish is more linseed oil. And when we uh, study the gene expression in this, uh, no, sorry, the fatty acid composition in these animals, we saw that there was an increase, particularly in DHA, when the animals were fed the diet, when the parents were fed the diet, 40% fish oil and 60% linseed oil. And this indeed was a reflection of the higher gene expression that was obtained when we increased the amount of linseed oil in the parental diet. And however, when the parents were fed 100% linseed oil, the, uh, this gene was underexpressed, and we found that in different studies. Not only the uh, delta-6 desaturase was affected, but other, uh, other genes were also uh, reflecting like for instance, the tumor necrosis factor alpha was overexpressed when we use 80% uh, linseed oil in the diet. And the, similarly, uh, other genes uh, like um, a cortisol receptor, uh, glucocorticoid receptor was also uh, affected. Now, uh, after feeding this broodstock with the, feeding this broodstock with the different uh, diets, when the animals were uh, three months uh, old, we fed them with either a high fish meal, fish oil diet, and in that case, there were no significant differences. You see that there is like a tendency, but there were no significant differences in the growth of the fish. And however, when we fed the animals with a very low fish meal um, and fish oil diet, the growth of the fish, the SGR of the fish, um, coming from parents uh, fed uh, the linseed oil was uh, significantly higher, particularly in, the, in this tool. 
Now, uh, these uh, results uh, have been uh, published in uh, different uh, uh, publications. And what is uh, more interesting, I'm not uh, going to present today, but what is uh, more interesting is that uh, uh, these fish that we see here, uh, the uh, siblings of these animals, we again submit them to a challenge test uh, when they were 18 months old. And uh, at that time, these fish showed no effect, showed no difference, showed no effect of the blue stock uh, diet. But those that, that had been fed low fish meal, low fish oil diet had like a uh, remembering in some way. And here they exactly uh, repeat the results when we fed them with a low fish meal, low fish oil diet. So uh, we are, uh, this is a thesis indeed of uh, Serhat uh, Turkmen, who is participating also in this uh, workshop. And uh, this year, uh, last year, we were trying to, uh, to, to select fish that were more, uh, that had show with a higher expression of this uh, desaturase uh, gene, uh, pathogen desaturase 2 uh, gene, and combine it with the programming. Uh, we were not very successful, but thankfully uh, a comment from Douglas explained us why we were not successful. And this year we are doing it, uh, doing it again. And cross fingers that we get uh, good results and we are able really to, to progress a bit more on this. Because our aim is to, to develop a protocol that will, uh, will allow us, without affecting the fish health, to uh, make the fish to be more prepared for the uh, utilization of uh, low fish meat fish oil diets. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, particularly Pipo, who is not here, here but also Serhat and uh, uh, some, some, some others. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you want to make uh, one question, two questions. Christine, you wanted to make some questions? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, it's, a, uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to program the fish for these new diets, I think. And uh, I think that there are uh, many which have been very interesting in that. So, congratulations. And uh, some question? Go ahead. Uh, also, congratulations from my side. Uh, regarding epigenetics, but also since you mentioned uh, at the beginning the selective breeding, uh, we see that in uh, the nutrients play an important role to see something expressed or not. But in terms of ingredients, how strict do you have to, how consistent you have to be with your diets? both in formulation and ingredients to see the effects or to go for selective breeding in order to, to be sure that it will be uh, uh, a long-term effect. Like in 10 years of selective breeding, you have to be consistent with your diets, for example. If you choose for a specific uh, trait, is it the same uh, for the epigenetics? So if you change ingredients on the uh, challenge, but the, uh, the nutrients remain the same, do you think it would be uh, different? Uh, okay, this is something that we that we are also planning to do this year. Uh, so, uh, but there are many different approaches because uh, uh, okay, the advantage of uh, working with epigenetics is that you can see the effects very fast. That's the uh, importance. Uh, the problem, perhaps, is that the the effect, uh, the persistence of the effect, uh, is uh, difficult to predict. And we have to see, really, for instance, if it will uh, be translated to the second generation, but the F2, that sometimes it, it happens. Uh, but uh, what is important of the study that I have not shown the results today, but uh, Serhat has done and is uh, ready to send the publication almost, is that uh, uh, it's not only the brewstock feeding, but probably if we uh, start to feed the animal from the very beginning, with diets, perhaps perhaps not extreme diets, because uh, uh, 
the larvae are very sensitive uh, for the development, but uh, with the uh, uh, medium uh, uh, levels, and we uh, continue like reducing the fish meat fish oil content in the diet, probably we will be able to help the fish to be adapted. The tricky thing is how to do that without affecting the health and the uh, performance of the fish. That's what we have to, that's why we need this protocol uh, to, 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 to review. Now, this can be done by continuous uh, feeding, uh, lower and lower fish meal fish oil diets, or this can be done also by pulses, because that's what we have done and that's what we have seen, that perhaps you can have the larvae with a very good uh, uh, high UFA diet, but uh, in the, when they uh, are a little bit uh, stronger, you just fed them one week or two weeks. Uh, in our case, it was one month. Uh, and then uh, you, you can re reinforce this uh, effect or this adaptation. Thank you. <coughs> Wait a second, because I, we have one question there, and we come back. Uh, in the, those last slides you showed the uh, SGR uh, grow. I didn't understand very well this. Uh, you have families? Uh, yeah, it's difficult because it's a bit complicated. I'll try to explain you. Okay. So, um, yes, they are families. They are families. Wait, they are families in the sense that they are coming from different male and female. Okay. Then these ones, but they are not, these are not selected. This is a, only a way of uh, identifying that their parents are different. It's only that. So what we did is uh, we, from each uh, brew stock, we took uh, uh, some spawnings, but for, from the same, same brew stock, and we took the animals up to the, that's up to the umbrella. Okay, field. just to assure that it's not a difference in the different parents uh, that could bias the Of course, of course, uh, that's it, that this is very interesting. Of course, they are coming from different parents. The only thing I can say is that all these different parents uh, in the first uh, um, spo in the first part of the spawning, there was no significant difference in their spawning quality. Whereas after they were fed the diets, there was difference in the spawning quality. So you were saying in the first month there was no difference. In, yes. In the beginning. Yes. Okay. Bueno. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Christine, she has a question. I think the the public this publication is in your pen drive. By the way, in the pen drive you have all the publications that have been pro being produced by Arina and also the leaflets uh, that uh, are given to you. Are you doing uh, any uh, uh, measurements to find out which mechanisms that uh, give this effects? Are they, uh, do you do our RBS uh, sequences thing, for example, to, yeah. to see the of the genome and all these yes. things? Because yes. it's difficult to know if it's really an epigenetic effect of or course. yeah. Of course. So yes. that would be interesting. You're right. First thing we have done. Uh, in a couple of, ta uh, of, of times, uh, Serhat has done the complete methylation of the genome and has compared, and there is no significant difference in the complete methylation of the genome. We discussed later. Maybe, perhaps. Okay. But we haven't seen the clear difference. So we were thinking then to, uh, we found differences in many genes which are related with the uh, lipid metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism in the liver. We found difference in the peppers, we have difference in the uh, in different in different genes, okay? So perhaps what we want to do is to see if there is a difference in the uh, methylation of the promoter of the genes. So more specific methylation in relation to each, each of the genes. We are working on that, still a lot of things to do. And we have done nothing on histone or we have done nothing on microRNAs, which are also 